Okay, so let's spend a little bit of time talking about risk analysis. So we'll talk about, and, and some of these concepts too are probably beyond probability and statistics, and they're just some, some good things to know um, that we uh, included in this course that, that you ought to be familiar with as you go forth and do risk assessments, particularly if you're doing risk assessments on um, Corps of Engineers, dams and levees. So I'm talking about some of the different types of risk and different ways we can, um, uh, I guess, slice and dice up the risk equation in terms of uh, metrics we calculate and report. Talk about um, different ways you can combine failure modes to obtain a total risk estimate for your dam or levy or whatever type of project you're estimating risk for and talk about some of the differences there, and we'll get, you'll actually get to see an example of that in the exercise, and then we'll talk about how risk calculations work and talk briefly about some of the risk plots that we use to portray results. All right, so what risk is, definition in different types, again, calculations, some of the different options, and some of the plots and metrics. So I uh, want to make a distinction here between risk and reliability. Um, so just a couple common terms here that it's good to, to understand their definitions and the differences, um, differences between them. So reliability, generally speaking, is a measure of the probability that the system you're evaluating performs as it's intended to perform. Failure, um, generically speaking, is the probability of the system not performing as you intend it to perform. So failure could be anything from you know, uh, a, a gate not opening when you, you know, press the button to open it, um, all the way up through, you know, distress, uh, signs of distress, all the way up through an actual, you know, physical failure and breach of your structure. So it's, you know, it's up to you and your particular application um, to decide what failure means for purposes of the types of risks that you want to estimate and, um, and manage. Typically, in, you know, or always in dam and levy safety, we're primarily interested in the risk of an actual, you know, breach of the structure that results in an uncontrolled release of water and, and subsequent flooding and potential for life loss. Uh, but you might be interested in defining failure in some other way, and, and that's okay. All these methods will work um, regardless of how you choose to define failure. Uh, you won't, you won't find a consistent definition throughout all the literature on risk, so this is, these are two descriptions that, I've, that I like, um, but there are others out there. So risk is, uh, one definition of risk is that it's the uncertain outcome of, a, of an event with respect to something of value, right? So that gives us kind of three elements, right? So we have some, some outcome, you know, maybe it's failure of a levy that um, in Kaplan and Garrick's paper, they would call a scenario, um, or it's, you know, some magnitude of earthquake followed by, you know, um, liquefaction and, and a subsequent failure and then consequences, right? That's an outcome. Or the outcome could be, you know, failure of the dam due to any, any failure mode. Um, so that's the outcome. The other key concept of risk is risk in and of itself is uncertainty, right? If things were certain, we wouldn't need risk and we wouldn't need probabilities. The reason uh, they exist is it gives us a way to quantify our uncertainty in, in what might happen. And then the last thing is something of value, so consequences being the other key element of, uh, of risk. So uh, Kaplan and Garrett refer to that as a triplet that consists of a scenario, its probability, and the associated consequences. So in our dam and levy safety programs, we, we break risk up into three components, which we've touched on throughout the week. The loading or the hazard, the um, capacity or response or performance or probability of failure, and lastly, what are the consequences or damages that result. It's just a graphic of the exact same thing that, that we use a lot to kind of um, communicate the concept of the elements that go into a risk analysis. Most of our risk analyses are structured around these three, three, these three elements. Um, from that, we can, in the formal, you know, the full, we're not going to go over the full derivation here, but this is generally how we implement um, the risk equation and our risk calculations in pretty much all of our, 
risk assessments we do for our dam and levee safety programs. So again, risk is an integral of continuous functions. This first term is the hazard um, or the loading curve. So usually that's going to be a seismic hazard curve or a flood hazard curve, but you could have other types of hazards that you might want to model. Um, the D here in front of it just means um, that it is uh, representing how we break up um, the hazard into increments um, when we um, do the integration, and you'll see a visual of that in a minute. Um, FR, or capital F with the sub R given S, that's the system response curve. So that's probability of failure given the hazard. And then consequences uh, are, in this example, consequences of failure uh, given failure occurs at the given hazard level. Uh, we always solve this with numerical methods. So what we're really solving in practice is the discrete version, which is just, you know, essentially a numerical approximation of the integral. So in these discrete approximations, we break it up into pieces, right, and solve it as a summation. All right, so what does that look like graphically? So graphically, we have these three three input functions, right, uh, maybe a flood or a seismic hazard curve. Uh, in the middle, a, a system response curve, probability of failure uh, versus the hazard, and then consequences versus the hazard. And then, you know, usually we're interested in failure, so usually this would be consequences given the hazard and, and failure. Uh, we can combine those three functions um, to form what in essence becomes a um, uncertainty distribution in consequences, right? And expressed here, this is, would be, an, um, it could either be a, a probability or an exceedance probability. We usually express these as exceedance probabilities. In most risk analysis, and certainly in all the, all the dam and levy safety ones we do in the core, um, you're usually going to annualize the risk. We usually do that by annualizing the hazard. So we're looking at, you know, annual floods or annual earthquakes or annual whatever the hazard might be. Um, that leads us to get annualized risk estimates out of the risk equation. So um, by annualizing the, the rate of the hazard, we get expected annual damage and annual probability of failure and average annual life loss. But you don't have to annualize. It, we do it as standard practice in dam and levy safety and in, in generally in the core for most of the risk analyses we do. Um, Types of risk. So the, these are these are the main types that that we in the core in our safety programs um, calculate and look at. So the reason we do this is because some of these um, different types of risk lead to different risk metrics that inform different types of decisions and and support. Um, how we talk about and communicate risk. So the first one is the total risk. So that's basically the aggregate of all the sources of risk, right? So if we're talking about total risk for a dam, you know, we're talking about all the ways that the population downstream could be flooded. Um, failure risk, uh, and I'll talk about these in a little more detail in subsequent slides, but failure risk is, is the risk uh, associated with failure of the dam and the total consequences of failure. Non-failure is associated with the probability of the dam not failing and the consequences of it not failing. Excess, uh, which in the core we, we call incremental risk, is a standard risk metric. This basically tells us um, what additional risk the, pop, the exposed population um, is subjected to. And so, um, you know, in like, uh, Let's say in the health field, right? If they're if they're wanting to implement, I don't know, maybe they're maybe they're evaluating some new new chemical, right, or something. What they're interested in is how much um, additional risk does that put on folks, right? And that's one of the key metrics they use. So we're we're doing the exact same thing in our safety programs. We're saying, okay, uh, if the population downstream is subjected to risk of the dam failing, how much additional risk is that over the risk they would experience if the dam didn't fail or couldn't fail. So the standard term in the literature for that is excess risk, and the core we're currently using the term incremental risk for that. 
Um, background risk. Background risk is essentially the risk if you're not exposed to the hazard. So this is the risk um, assuming the people downstream of the dam or in the levied area um, are not exposed to, to the possibility of the dam or levy failing. Um, we used to call this in the core, and we still do in a lot of our publications in the core, we call this non-breach risk, but we're um, in a state of transitioning and improving some of our terminology. So the current term we're using for that is background risk. And then system risk is um, if you wanted to estimate risk for a collection of projects, like say a, a river system that had multiple dams and levees, and you wanted to look at the risk for that collection of facilities as a system, um, you could do it that way. Key concept, uh, some key concepts here in terms of the risk equation. So this is the, the same types of risk showing you kind of how they're mathematically obtained. So total risk is from all the sources of interest. In this case, we're talking about either failure or non-failure of the dam or levy. So failure risk is probability failure, and this um, consequence term is the total consequences of failure. You'll see that's different in later slides for other types of risk. And then non-failure is the probability of non-failure, which is one minus the probability of failure here in this term times the consequences of if the dam does or dam or levy doesn't fail. Um, the excess incremental risk, uh, so this is where we look at the risk over and above um, due to the population being exposed to failure. So um, it's used primarily in our safety programs to make safety decisions and investments. And where the calculation comes from is we calculate what we call the excess consequences, which is the difference in the consequences between what would happen if the dam failed versus what would happen if the dam or levy didn't fail given the same um, hazard event. So um, the key concept here is that consequences that would have, would have occurred regardless of whether or not the structure fails, we don't count that as part of the excess risk. So if you think of the analogy, kind of the health analogy, you know, if we're evaluating the risk, um, uh, you know, risk of some disease due to some, you know, um, some chemical or something that's out there in the world, um, we're only interested in, you know, the, the incidence of the disease that's due to that chemical, right? So we subtract out uh, or we don't include inc incidences where you, you got the disease, but you didn't get it because of that specific chemical that we're evaluating, right? So the analogy is the same with dam and levy safety, right? We only, we're only for our safety programs interested in the risk that is um, a direct result of the dam failing. If, if fatalities would have occurred regardless because maybe there was, you know, a large release through the spillway, those don't get counted as excess risk. The other term you'll see that we've adopted for this in the core at least is dam risk for dams and levy risk for levies. So when you hear dam and levy risk, they're referring to this excess risk, which currently in a lot of our um, publications is called incremental risk. All right, next one is background risk. So for background risk, um, this is assuming um, the population at risk is not exposed to the hazard. Uh, that we're evaluating in this case, we're evaluating failure. So we assume that the structure performs perfectly as intended. In other words, we assume it doesn't fail. So we assume either perfect reliability, which is the same as assuming a zero probability failure. So we can plug that in our risk equation as um, uh, with this zero here representing the pro zero probability of failure and the consequences of non-failure that gives us the background risk. Total risk, we can obtain either by combining the failure and the non-failure risk or by combining the excess and the background risk. Um, either one of those uh, ways of combining our risk estimates will give us the total um, risk exposure that, that a given population has. All right, system risk. So um, the key thing to remember about system risk is there's lots of different ways you can define and describe systems, right? So system, uh, circling all the way back to day one where we talked about sets and elements, right? So it's a set of elements that function together, you know, in some way. So in that sense, you can think of a failure mode as being a system, right? It's a system of these discrete events that collectively uh, function to generate, you know, a failure mode or a failure. 
and we decompose it into this you know sequence of events or system of events. Uh, an individual dam or levee is usually a system of more than one potential failure mode, right? So you can think of dams and levees as systems that have components and that can have um, multiple failure modes for different components. Uh, a portfolio, so, you know, if you're like the Corps of Engineers, we have a large portfolio that we um, own and operate of dams and a large portfolio of levees. So a, por a, a portfolio of projects is also a system that we need to manage in, in some way. And then you can, you know, break up your portfolio into regions, maybe, you know, by river system or some other way and uh, and define systems that way. So the, the whole concept scalable and a lot of the principles apply to all these levels uh, within the scale of, of what could be a system. All right, so how does the risk equation work? This is another graphic depiction of how the risk equation works. Again, we have the three input functions, hazard, performance, and consequences. And what we're basically doing is we're, um, in a sense, combining um, these functions, right? So we have a, you know, some some exceeds probability that gives us a hazard. We have some hazard that gives us a response or probability of failure. Given that, we have some magnitude of consequences, and that, at least in, in principle, gives us a point on this curve of exceedance probability versus consequences, right? So we're combining these three functions mathematically in a way similar to this to obtain this um, consequence uh, distribution, which is which is where our risk estimate ultimately comes from. Again, we've talked about this a lot this week, but the risk equation is solved with numerical integration. So if you just want to conceptualize it, think of, you know, the risk equation as being this function of, you know, exceedance probability versus consequences, and we're trying to get the area under it, which the area under an exceedance curve is the expected value, right? And again, lots of ways to solve, numerically solve integrals, you know, rectangle rules, trapezoidal rules, um, and the Monte Carlo method, which we, we saw in the exercise. The accuracy, again, this is a bit of a repeat, but just to drive the point home, um, the accuracy of um, doing um, a Riemann sum, so rectangle or trapezoidal rule, is based on how uh, the size and spacing of your intervals. So this is the concept where I've talked about a few times this week, where we take our hazard curve and divide it into slices or intervals. Um, this is kind of the conceptual application of that. So how 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 um, how thick or how thinly you slice those intervals um, affects the precision. And then we saw in Monte Carlo that. Um, the analogy there is the number of samples affects our, our precision of our estimate. Event tree analysis, we have whole whole courses that go into this in much detail too. We're only going to have one slide on this, but I talked about this at the beginning of the week, so just want to, if you're not familiar with event tree analysis, to show you what it looks like. But all an event tree is, it's a, just a way uh, to graphically portray uh, the risk equation and how we um, calculate the risk equation, usually using something like, the, say, the rectangle rule. Um, so it's just a graphical depiction of all the events um, that um, that are in our risk analysis to which we assign probabilities, and then we combine to obtain our risk estimate. So this sequence of events from the hazard event to a failure mode, which we might decompose into a subset of events through to consequences, all go in the event tree. Uh, event trees are left to right. It usually starts with an initiating event. Flood or seismic hazard, for example, ends with failure and consequences. It has to be logical. Most of the time that means it's also going to be chronological. And um, it, again, gives us a way to decompose all the events that lead to failure. Um, anytime you're doing event tree math, it's just multiplication and addition. So we multiply along pathways. So when we have a sequence of events defined, maybe some, some magnitude of earthquake, some probability of failure for a particular failure mode, some exposure of the population, maybe daytime versus nighttime, and, uh, and to get the total probability of that pathway, it's a multiplication process. And that comes from the multiplication rule that we saw earlier this week. And then if, when you want to combine risks, let's say you want to combine 
um, and get a risk estimate for failure mode number one. Um, so you have to look at all of these, any pathway that has failure mode one in it that leads to failure, um, you need to combine them. So one of the rules of, of entries is that all these branches and pathways should be mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. That means we can we can just add things up. Um, uh, think of it kind of vertically um, using the rule of addition for mutual exclusive events. So if you wanted the total risk, let's say for failure mode one, you'd look at all these pathways that go through failure mode one and lead to failure. So in this case, there's four of them, right? These top two for the two exposures up here and these two down here. And you could add those up and that will give you your total total estimate for failure mode one. You can do it for each failure mode. You can do it for the whole dam or levy or however you like to, you know, however you want to slice and dice up your risk estimate. Uh, fault tree analysis is less common. Um, it is used a lot in the world of um, electrical and mechanical um, for looking at like reliability of electrical and mechanical systems. So it is a system engineering um, method. It involves, um, it's like a logic, uh, framework, so it has these and and or um, operations, and typically it's um, generally top down. So the top event you usually start with a failure event at the top, and then work your way down and break out all the different um, pathways um, that could have led to that failure. So it's in a sense a little bit kind of the opposite way of tackling it from an event tree. It's more of a, a kind of a um, starting at failure and working your way backwards. And again, if you're electrical or mechanical, this is really um, the most commonly used method in that field for looking at reliability. All right, couple types of risk models and types of risk estimates. So marginal risk, that's the formal term. Typically uh, in the Corps of Engineers, we want to portray um, risk estimates for individual failure modes based on their marginal risk estimate. What that means, is we estimate essentially the risk of a failure mode sort of in isolation, right? So we ignore any other failure modes and any interactions that our failure mode might have with those other failure modes. And we just kind of think of a, imagine a world where that's the only failure mode and we estimate its risk and we plot it. We call that the marginal risk. The reason we do that is it's um, a better metric for identifying failure modes that might be actionable uh, because what can happen is when you start to look at the interactions between failure modes, you can start to mask some of the underlying risk that's um, associated with individual failure modes. So you don't want to go out and do a modification, right, and then do a risk assessment after your modification and find out you missed a um, failure mode because it was masked by the interactions between failure modes. Best way to avoid that is to just do the marginal risk estimate, which means estimate the risk as if it's the only failure mode. These next couple types of options are more about um, applications for getting a total risk estimate. So when you want to combine multiple failure modes for a system into a total risk estimate, um, there's a couple basic options. Um, one is called the, we call the joint risk model. So this basically means that you believe uh, your system is such that more than one failure mode could happen during the same hazard event. So an example of this might be you have a, a long levy system such that if the levy fails in one location during some flood event, um, it's not gonna uh, prevent a failure from occurring somewhere else, right? So during the same flood event, you could have multiple breaches along your levy. Um, examples for dams would be, you know, maybe you have a dam where you have a dam and an appurtenant pertinent dike uh, structure, and maybe they both overtop at practically the same elevation and same time, in which case, if overtopping occurs, it's likely that both, both are gonna fail, right? So you would choose something like the joint risk approach um, for, doing, for combining the risk estimate, and you'll get to see this in the exercise as well. Um, the other one is called competing risk. This is a little bit new. Um, at least in the Corps of Engineers. Um, it's widely used in, in other fields. Um, it aligns well with kind of the engineering concept of uh, looking at things from the perspective of the weakest link. So competing risk is kind of the formal way to do this correctly. 
Uh, so in this example, you're, the assumption you're making uh, when you select this type of model to combine failure modes is that the first failure, in other words, the weakest link in your system, happens first, and once it happens, for whatever reason, it prevents other failures from happening or other consequences from happening. So if you think of it like a, just a, a chain link, right, if you pull on this chain link, you know, what's going to, when it fails, what's going to happen? Well, the weakest link is going to fail, and then once it fails, there's no more chain, so none of the other links can fail, right? So you're only going to get one failure. So that's the, that's the concept and a couple examples here where it might apply in a dam or levy risk analysis. So let's say you have a levy that fails at one location prior to overtopping, and it's not a huge levied area such that the, when it fails, the levied area fills up with water. Uh, before water can get to the top of the levee, such that if the water continues to rise and the levee overtops, um, two things happen. One is you don't have much head differential on the levee anymore because the levee area is full of water, right? So it might not even fail. And secondly, even if it does fail, everything's already been flooded, so you're not going to have any, any more consequences, right? So that would be one, one potential application. And then for dams, a potential application would be and this is pretty common for dams, the dam fails and the breach happens relatively quickly, right, usually in the matter of minutes to hours, um, and the reservoir usually quickly empties, right? So once that happens, you've basically taken the load off of other failure modes. So unless they literally happen at nearly the same time, you know, within minutes or within, you know, an hour or two of each other, uh, which is relatively unlikely in, in a lot of cases, um, the emptying of the reservoir basically ends the, ends the, ends the um, event, so to speak, and other failure modes don't develop to failure. So that would be a, a potential example of where uh, competing risk might be a good application for a dam. Um, uncertainty, we've talked about uncertainty. We're not going to actually go over this method, but just to be aware of it. So oftentimes we talked about um, the, the benefit of separating out the knowledge uncertainty from the natural variability or the random part of the uncertainty. So when, we, when we're doing Monte Carlo analysis to model uncertainty, we usually then have to do the Monte Carlo analysis in two loops or two steps. So in the exercise earlier today, we saw where you, where you do it just in one step. What you can do is you can separate out the uncertainty and, and put a outer loop around um, around the Monte Carlo that we did earlier today and put your knowledge uncertainty in that outer loop and your natural variability in the inner loop. There's other ways to do this. Some dis I think the seismic folks um, do something similar with, but they typically do it with logic trees. Um, so there's other techniques for separating out the uncertainty, but with Monte Carlo, this is one of the common ways of, uh, of doing it. All right, risk plots and metrics. This is going to be another terminology change that's coming down the pipeline here pretty soon. Um, if you're familiar with um, tolerable risk guidelines and specifically the Corps of Engineers tolerable risk guidelines, you, would kn you will know these plots as being the little fn on the left and the big fn on the right. Um, that has caused some problems um, when we've done, when we've had some external peer reviews of our safety programs. Uh, the little fn is leading to some misinterpretation and incorrect interpretations of this plot on the left. And the big fn um, also, but to a lesser extent, is leading to some misinterpretations. And these things already exist in the world of risk and already have kind of names. So we're going to try to make a transition here and change the names to be a little more consistent with names that other others in the risk world use. So. The little fn is going to, um, this hasn't been adopted officially yet, but it's, it's, we're probably 95% there, right? We're going to, it's going to become the alpha n. It's going to be the same plot. It's just going to have a different labeling and a different explanation than we've had in the past. And the big fn, it, we might still call it the big fn, but we're also going to refer to it as a, a loss exceedance curve. So what these plots show is on the vertical axis of the plot on the left is um, you're essentially plotting probability of failure. And on the um, bottom axis on the right, you're 
um, calculating the mean estimate of consequences conditioned on failure. So this is basically, um, if a failure were to occur, what would the expected value of my consequences be? And that's what gets plotted here on the bottom. So it's not an actual life loss system. It's an expected value over all the different ways that failure could occur. Um, the plot on the right, if, you, if you're comfortable with um, hazard curves like uh, flood hazard curves and seismic hazard curves, um, this is the equivalent of that, but it's on consequences instead of like stage or PGA or something like that, right? So it's just an exceedance curve or the other name for it we talked about earlier in the week is a survival function for consequences. So it's the probability of, of consequences exceeding some value. Um, we have tolerable risk guidelines on here, so the diagonal um, dotted lines represent our guidelines. On these types of plots, um, a slope of negative one is considered a, um, a risk uh, a risk neutral guideline, and I think uh, we might touch on that in a later slide here in a minute. But the goal is that you generally, you know, down and to the left is generally lower risk and better on both of these plots. Up and to the right is higher risk and, and worse. All right, so again, what these, what these, where these come from in terms of our risk equations. So when we combine the hazard and the system response curves or input functions, we get effectively an exceedance probability for the response or, pro, you know, vertical here is probability of failure for response. Uh, we, we integrate that. So again, that's the area under it, and that's our annual probability of failure, which we now call alpha on the alpha n plot, formerly the little fn. And then when we do all three functions together, we combine the hazard, the performance, and um, in this, um, this bottom one here in the middle of the consequences, we get this exceedance probability of life loss or whatever your consequence metric is. Um, this curve itself is the loss exceedance curve or what we currently call the big FN curve. And the area under that curve is our estimate of the annualized risk, right, or in this case, the average annual life loss. So it's alpha, and that's equal to alpha times n on the alpha n plot. So again, area under an exceedance function or a survival function and a CDF is equal to the expected value, right? So let me go back one slide here. So if this, like say this red diamond here in the middle represents your risk estimate, right? Um, that risk estimate is equal to the area under the corresponding um, under the uh, for the corresponding uh, curve here on the left exceedance curve. I think I picked the wrong one though because I think they don't have they don't have the total shown here on the right. So let's pick this one here. This uh, this red one on the left, I guess that's a red circle, um, is um, dam A failure mode one. So that's kind of this purplish one here on the right. So the area under this FN function gives us the annual average annual life loss we plot here, which is equal to this alpha value, which is roughly one e to the minus five times the life loss, which is roughly two, right? So these these two plots are related to each other. And, uh, you know, you can kind of derive similar information um, from either of these plots. All right, other risk metrics, and there's way too many to cover today, but just a few that are common. So benefits, obviously, we we are interested um, in the return on our investment, right? So we look at things like benefits, we look at net benefits, which are benefits minus costs, and things like that. Um, another common metric is called incremental cost and benefit. So this is um, this is really common in the core for um, cases where we don't monetize benefits. So if you like environmental uh, related projects where we don't um, try to estimate the monetary value of them. We look at um, the benefits with some metric, and what we're doing here is we're looking for um, how much additional benefit we get for an additional investment in cost, and what we're looking for there is breakpoints where we start to, you know, where costs start to go up relative to benefits, right? So the idea there is the point of diminishing return. Um, conditional value at risk. Um, this one is to quantify kind of the risk in the extremes, so in the tails. Um, the way to think of this measure, it's, it's kind of like a way of looking at what's commonly referred to as the risk of ruin. Uh, 
or the risk of a catastrophe, right? So, you know, you can have an event that has a relatively low probability, but if it has really high consequences, right, um, if it does happen, the outcome is going to be catastrophic, right? So it's like the, the idea of, I don't know if you think, think of it by analogy, you know, managing your retirement portfolio. You know, there's some really small probability out there that you could lose all your money, right? So that the way we measure that, would be with conditional value at risk that says, okay, what's my risk for the um, extreme high consequence event? And then the last one is assurance. The Corps of Engineers uses this um, to evaluate levies for the National Flood Insurance Program. It's also one of our reporting metrics for, for planning studies. So this, all assurance is, is it's a measure of confidence. So we've talked about confidence intervals throughout the week. Uh, I'm not sure why we made up a different word, assurance, but we did. Um, but all it is is a confidence level. And the idea of assurance here is, is again, tying back to stuff from earlier in the week, is it ends up being a trade-off between type 1 and type 2 error. So anytime you want to have more confidence to avoid a type, let's say, type 1 error, uh, or, well, let me say type 2 because that's the type we usually try to avoid in the safety program. So you want a higher level of assurance to avoid a type 2 error, the trade-off is that means you're going to get more type 1 errors. So one thing I always, one analogy I always use is that, you know, when the engineer says, you know, we should be conservative, you have to be real, really careful using that word because what's conservative to one group is not conservative to others. So oftentimes what's conservative to the engineer is going to be economically unconservative, right? So this is this trade-off between errors. Anytime you get uh, one type of error, um, or anytime you hedge your bets to avoid one type of error, you get more of the other. Oh, uh, it's a question in the chat about refreshing on the type one and type two errors. So um, type one is a false positive and type two is a false negative. So type two would be an example where we don't want to, um, we want to err on the side of safety. And if we're gonna, uh, if we're gonna be wrong on our risk estimate, we want to overestimate the risk so that we avoid um, the false negatives being where we say the risk is low and we say we don't have to worry about this dam because the risk is low, but the risk is actually high, right? So in in risk analysis, especially at screening level, we tend to try to err on the high side if we're going to err at all. Um, and again, it's to avoid those errors of, you know, saying a dam has low risk when it really doesn't. But the trade-off is you get more type 1 errors where you get more dams that have higher risk estimates that then go on to the next phase of study where you have to then do a higher level of risk analysis. And, you, and when you do that higher level of risk analysis, you know, that requires time and money. And then you find out for a certain percentage of those dams that, oh, the risk really wasn't as high as I thought it was in screening. I can, uh, oh, sorry, pin box popped up again. I can um, put it back in the routine program, right? So that's the trade-off, right? And that should be a conscious trade-off, right? So in the core, at least, we've made a conscious trade-off that it's screening. We're okay if, if we're on the high side um, on some of our dams such that they go to the next level of risk assessment. And then in the next level of risk assessment, we say, well, this one actually isn't high risk. It's not as high as we thought. Let's, we can now put it back in the, in the normal process. Um, we'd rather have that happen than the opposite happen where we say, oh, this dam's fine, right? And then we find out later it's not fine. So that's that's the kind of the application of this this trade-off. Uh, and then the last thing we'll talk about here is decision criteria. Lots of different decision criteria. The two common ones used in the core: uh, tolerable risk for the safety programs. We're not going to do a deep dive on tolerable risk guidelines, but basically those dashed lines on the plot is one of the ways, one of several ways we measure tolerability of risk. So generally. Um, the framework we've adopted in the Corps of Engineers is there's kind of three three um, bins you can be in in terms of risk. You can have risk that's so high that it's unacceptable, which means you should do something about it. We have risk that is so low that it's acceptable, and what that means is that it's so low that um, kind of nobody even thinks about it or nobody cares, right? So when you you know, I don't know, when you um, 
you know, when you when you're walking down the street, are you you know, are you actively thinking about and managing the risk associated with walking down the street, right? Probably not, right? It's low enough that you don't probably don't even think about it. So that would be acceptable. Um, the philosophy we and the policy we've adopted in the Corps of Engineers is that dam and levee risks are never um, acceptable. So we never just let them, you know, exist out there without being managed. And then the middle category in between is risks that are tolerable. And the reason they chose the word tolerable and what that means is that tolerable risks are risks that we acknowledge exist. Um, we can't make them zero, but society is willing to live with that risk in order to get some benefit in return, right? So we build a dam, it you know reduces flood risk downstream, but there's still always gonna be some risk of failure, right? No matter how good the dam is, it's never zero. So um, if that risk is small enough, such that society's okay with living downstream of that dam because they're getting the flood risk management benefits in return, then we call that a tolerable risk. And you know, the core, we set our guidelines, um, we call them agency guidelines because we've selected them essentially on behalf of society in terms of how we're gonna manage our program. So that's what those diagonal lines were on the earlier plot um, are the tolerable risk guidelines. And generally the goal is to get below, if you could get the risk below those guidelines. Um, one of the principles behind the guidelines we set is uh, two, two principles. One is um, that we don't want the risk of our dams and levees to be a significant contribution to someone's overall risk. And then the second is from an investment standpoint, as I mentioned on the plot, our guidelines are risk neutral, which means we generally make decisions based on the, the um, and, and set priorities based on the expected value of the risk, so say average annual life loss. So dams with a higher, or levees with a higher average annual life loss would generally get a higher higher um, place in the priority. And then net benefits, which is just benefits minus costs, which is used in our um, economic, when we do economic-based um, investments. So things like planning studies, um, things like um, the major rehab program, um, stuff like that, maintenance those types of things. Those are usually um, economic-based decisions and net benefits is one of the common metrics for making economic decisions. We're trying to maximize, essentially maximize the return on your investment. Sorry. David, do you see those tolerable risk guidelines changing any, like in the next 10 to 20 years as the population increases? Oh. Yeah, so that has come up. Um, and it's it's come up. They, I don't. I, I didn't share the the guideline in this presentation, but we have a guideline. Um, there's a guidelines for what we call societal risk, and that, all that means is for events that could have uh, multiple life loss. And then there's a separate guideline for individual risk. So um, the idea there is um, for you know the person or the group that has the highest risk. And I don't want to go too far in the weeds, but it, it, those two guidelines revolve around two um, guiding principles being equity and efficiency. Um, equity means that everyone is entitled to some, some level of protection against risk. So that's, that is where the individual risk guideline comes from. Right now, for the core, it's one in 10,000 per year. So, um, so the person downstream of the dam that's most at risk, their risk of dying should be, due to dam failure, should be less than one in 10,000 per year. And then um, this is, um, the, the efficiency means that, you know, we should um, spend, uh, essentially get the most bang for our buck, right? You know, for the dollars we're spending. So that's where the societal risk um, guideline comes in. It's, it's more of a, a, more based on the idea of being efficient. So it's a balance between those two. But to circle back to your question, the individual risk is one of the metrics we've actually looked at recently. And I think the Bureau of Reclamation actually revised the way they talk about it a little bit. We have not yet. Uh, because if you look at population statistics, um, one, of the, one of the rationales we've used for setting our, setting our guideline at one in 10,000 is that we don't wanna substantially add to someone's 
um, background risks of, of dying from all causes, right? And so you can plot that over time, uh, or you can plot that by age. You know, the, the I think it's the CDC or one of the federal organizations publishes these stats on a regular basis. So you can plot it by age, and then you can also see how it evolves over time. And it has been, you know, consistently going down over time. So yeah, so the, you know, the odds of um, someone dying or going down, uh, you know, historically over the last over the last decades. So we're getting to the point where one in 10,000 um, is starting to get maybe a little bit borderline in some folks' mind as far as it's whether it's low enough. So yes, uh, it has been discussed. It is possible that they could change over the next 10 to 20 years for sure. Um, the other thing that could happen is on the societal risk guideline is this idea of efficiency, right? So right now we're still for dams, we're still kind of in a phase of fixing all the obvious things that need to be fixed, if that makes sense. So all the things that are, you know, clearly not tolerable, clearly higher risk, right? But when you start to get down to things that plot close to this line, right, the decisions in some ways get more difficult where you have to really ask, you know, is it is it really too high? Is it low enough? And, uh, you know, that's where those conversations, I think, in the core will will likely ramp up in relation to your question, right? Because right now those issues don't come into play all that much, but I think down the road as we get, as we work our way farther down in our portfolio, I, I think it's possible that those discussions will become more important down the road. Just want to offer a quick thought. There was, a, there was an additional item in the chat that earlier that I missed, noting that um, ANCOLD, which is the um, Australia's National Commission on Large Dams um, just updated their societal risk guidelines. And so on the plot I showed in the presentation, you may have noticed there was a little box in the bottom right-hand corner uh, to designate areas that um, are risks that have very low probabilities but very high consequences. So ANCOL used to have a similar box, but they've recently updated theirs and taken that out and just continued the diagonal line all the way through the plot. Um, so one of the one of the ways we've viewed that in the Corps of Engineers um, is the we what we're trying to manage is the idea of um, making large investments to chase small numbers. So at least the intent of what we're trying to accomplish with the way our guidelines are set up is we want the emphasis to be on risk reduction and solutions to manage risk rather than on you know making large investments in more studies trying to chase down small very small numbers that you know ultimately you may never be able to chase down so um for at least for now that that box in the bottom right corner still remains on our core guidelines but as was noted in the chat ANCOLD has chosen to remove it um, from their guidelines so Subtle, subtle differences there, but again, the overarching principles are, are, are pretty similar between the two um, organizations. So the first question here is, which of the following is not a problem that we would typically solve with Monte Carlo methods? So if you remember throughout the week, we actually have looked at all four of these types of problems, but only three of them we've used for, uh, we've used the Monte Carlo to solve. So we've done optimization, integration, and uncertainty, all three we did in the exercise today. So hypothesis testing would be the, the best choice as a problem that is typically not solved with Monte Carlo. Um, second one, inverse transform sampling is used to generate the random samples um, from practically any parametric distribution. You can even use it for non-parametric um, distributions as well uh, within the Monte Carlo method. So the best answer there is true. Third question is the risk equation integral um, is typically solved by uh, some sort of numerical method, either Riemann sum, which is just the formal uh, name for things like the rectangle or trapezoidal rule or the Monte Carlo method. So um, uh, we've done both, so the answer is true there. We've used um, both methods, and you'll get to see it again in the last exercise here. 
Um, number four, which of the following are different types of risk or different ways we can calculate and talk about risk? So all three of these are types of risk. Um, risk of failure, incremental risk, which we're trying to transition to maybe um, using a more standard term, excess risk. Again, currently in the core, we use the term incremental risk. Um, total risk, which is the risk from all, all um, sources of interest. Um, so all three of those are, are possible types of risk that we might calculate and um, use to make risk-informed decisions. So the uh, best answer there would be D. And then the last question, number five, um, which of the following is um, the greatest benefit of using some of the advanced Monte Carlo sampling methods that we talked about in yesterday's lecture, such as important sampling, stratified sampling, and Markov chain Monte Carlo. So um, B, greater chance of rejecting the null hypothesis. That has to do with hypothesis testing, has nothing to do with Monte Carlo, so that one's not applicable. Um, more realizations is is not a benefit, right? Because well, it, it it's a benefit in the a sense that um, you will get a more accurate result, but it's a disbenefit in the sense that it will take longer to run. So it's not the reason um, these methods exist, right? So it is it is relevant to Monte Carlo, but it's not relevant to these particular uh, methods and why we use them. And then autocorrelation, so again, um, autocorrelation um, is important and does uh, and is relevant, um, particularly in Markov chain, uh, in the Markov chain Monte Carlo method, but it's not, um, it's not the reason we use it, right? We, again, we don't use these methods to try to reduce any sort of autocorrelation because um, generally in these in these methods, with the exception of Markov chain, we're doing um, independent sampling. So the the best benefit um, for these methods is that it runs faster. And the reason it runs faster in all these cases is because it converges to a solution with fewer, um, fewer realizations, which is what makes it faster. And again, you know, for simple problems like the ones we did in the exercise, right, these methods aren't going to, you know, they calculate in the blink of, blink of an eye. So doing an advanced um, algorithm is not going to make a difference. But in real world complex risk analyses, um, it can make a big difference in terms of compute speed.